Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Lockdown Padres Podcast, which is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day for Tuesday, December 6th. As always, I'm your host with sometimes, occasionally, but certainly not always the most. Javier Reyes, you might be familiar with some of my work at Baseball FYI, Friars on Base, Off Bench Baseball, or Just Baseball, to which I'm a staff writer for. Follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or the Twitter page for the show, which is at LO underscore Padres. Um, thank you for making uh, Lockdown Padres your hashtag first listen every day. We're free and available on all platforms. Enough of that out of the way. Going to transition into a chat that I did with my buddy Miller Thomas of Locked On Diamondbacks. We talked on Friday. It already went up on his channel, but here it is now on my channel. Hopefully the quality and whatnot is pretty decent. Uh, but we talk about Mark Melanson. We talk a whole lot about farm system stuff. Just just building a baseball team, I guess, and what, what went wrong with the Padres in 2020 and or 2021 and just kind of uh, breaking all that down. So it's, it's a whole lot of fun, really fun chat. Millard is always the best. And without further ado, guys, let's get on into it. Welcome back to the Locked On Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. You're listening to who? The always charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas. I'm a multimedia journalist and I'm a graphic designer. So please go check out my website, MillerThomas24, that my portfolio.com. On there, you can see all my latest work from my packages to my articles, from my photos, and my graphic design. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at CreatorThomas24 for my personal account, or just look up Locked on Dimebacks on both Twitter and Instagram for the podcast handle. But what are we talking about in today's pod? Well, we got a special guest for you guys today. We got Javier Reyes of Locked On Padres on the pod to discuss why the why the Padres decide to let Mark the Shark Melanson go for nothing, talk a little CBA lockout. So we're going to talk a whole bunch of different topics on today's podcast. So you're going to want to stick around for this one. But let me first start off by saying Thank you for making Locked On Dimebacks your first listen every day. I would not be doing this podcast without you. It's free and available on all platforms, so please continue, please continue to tell your friends. But now, let's bring on Javier Reyes of Locked On Padres. <laughs> Daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And as promised, let's bring on Javier Reyes. Javier! What's going on? I got my Snuggie, everybody. What's going on, everybody? Felt like this was like a WWE intro or something like yeah. that. Oh, so. The Undertaker! Oh, the, what's the Rock cooking? All that stuff. Uh, thanks for having me on, man. This is this is a blast. As you know, we are in lockout season. As always, I love your intro. As always, I love it. I, I love it so much. It's so good. Um, I'm really excited to be on here because you know what it is, man. We gotta talk. We gotta talk mm. lockout. We gotta mm. talk about the shark. Mm. Mm-hmm. we gotta mm-hmm. talk the shark we definitely gotta talk the shark oh, and it's, it's important to keep the people with good with content just because the mlb's in lockout doesn't mean they have to be locked out of the wonderful sport of baseball yeah i mean they the players are locked out right now they're not gonna be able to do anything i mean some of those players are hurt they can't even get the rehab from their trainer so it's a sticky situation in baseball as we know javi and of course we're gonna talk about mark the shark melanson because that's why we brought you on today talk a little lockout but mostly jab you in your stomach about Mark Melanson what what the Padres doing (laughs) but before we even get to the D-backs and Mark Melanson I just want to know how you're doing buddy and and how you feeling about the Padres (laughs) offseason so far how's it going for you I know how how it feels as a D-backs fan but as a Padres fan how's the offseason going for you look it's a little bit mixed it's a little bit mixed I'm not gonna lie but it hasn't in so a lot of it depends on what your expectations were for the Padres one of the problems is that They're the Padres, and everybody knows A.J. Prower, the wheeling and dealing king. Mm -hmm. He's made a lot of moves over the years. I mean, we saw what happened that that last offseason back in December of last year with the Snell, with the Musgrove, with Hassan Kim, re-signing Jerickson Profar, Mark Melanson, who we're going to talk about in a little bit. Mm -hmm. All sorts of moves all over the place. And then even years before that, like even when they weren't very good, like trading Framil Reyes, which I wish that they could have kept. I don't think that decision was bad at the time. But you wish you could keep guys like that. It happens, but he does all these sorts of deals. He signed a chat. The Padres for a long time have been a team that's done something almost every year. 
in the off season, basically since like 2018, 2019, and even years before that, when Preller first took over famously with the, the Matt Kemp trades and what have you. And then now we say, face a situation where it's like, yeah, the lockout was a part of this, but also they didn't do too much. Uh, they basically added two relievers, Robert Suarez and Luis Garcia, who I like very much. Um, and then they strangely traded for Jorge Alfaro. I don't know really why. I don't think it matters, though, in fairness. It's whatever. It's just another catcher. It's not like they gave up too much. Um, but they just haven't made that big splash. And I think a lot of Padres fans that I've talked to or have just replied to me on Twitter are like, hey, what about Matt Olson? And while I could be a jerk and start heading on here and being like, yeah, no, duh, you want Matt Olson. So you and everybody else, right? But I get it. And what that is, is everyone's saying, we saw what the weakness was with this team this year, and it was the guy at first base. You might be unfamiliar, but one of my rules on the podcast currently is I do not mention, I do not say his name, the guy oh. who plays first base for the podcast. It's an ongoing bit. It is a, a silenced word. You know how in Around the Horn, they have like banned words and stuff? Uh, mm-hmm. The first base for the Padres is, is a banned word uh, currently. So you have that, and some people are like, right, well, we got to upgrade. What about starring Marte? That is true, but I think that that it's a, it's a, just a game of expectations. And right now, uh, at least currently, because remember, we still got a lot of free agents left. That's one thing that's kind of been lost on people uh i think is yeah it's it's the lockout happened and whatnot but there's still a lot of guys still have this was a great free agent class like the best free agent arguably is still on the board in Carlos Correa. so there's still a lot to look forward to still a lot of changes that can happen for the padres this might not be their last moves that they made but for now i think it's going about how i expected at least for the beginning part that was yeah, a really that's long-winded kind of, answer. <laughs> no, and more the merrier because that's kind of one reason why I kind of enjoyed this impending lockout because we finally got some action during this baseball free agency. Like I was talking with Locked On Race host Yuli Sembrano about this was kind of like NBA free agency. Like a lot of the top guys was gone after the first week, and usually it feels like you got to wait till winter meetings. Yeah, last year it felt like you had to wait till January or February before the big guys. It was like guys are already reporting to spring training, and we're just now seeing these deals come through so i'm glad that this cba at least sped up the activity and aggressiveness level of these teams these agents these players so i have enjoyed that but when you look at this padres offseason what are you expecting you mentioned he who may not be named i guess we we won't mention him either on this pod i guess you're looking for an upgrade or a trade or whatever but do you think the padres are going big fish hunting this offseason or are they going to try move their first baseman like what is the plan for this padres because of course they had this collapse at the end of last season but this is still a pretty good roster on paper maybe aj mm-hmm. probably like it was a lot of unluckiness and let's just run it back and see what happens next season so can i can i unleash the take unleash it are you ready can I be a little bit of a jerk? Oh, oh, jerk. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, this side of him. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. here's what it is. Here's what it is. Here's what it is. Look, I I find it very odd that people like what we just watched, in my opinion, the two big storylines that we got in terms of just overall like teams that matter the most this year. Not like, okay, Otani was the story of the season as a player, obviously, right? Shout out to Shohei Otani, just an absolute king. Uh, p- just. Man, by the way, if you're ever bored, just tweet about Shohei Otani. You will get engagement on Twitter. It's awesome. <laughs> I mean, and as you should, as one should. But uh, in terms of teams, it's the San Francisco Giants and the Atlanta Braves. And two things I think that those teams have in common. Number one, the Giants, we learned that we really sometimes underestimate organizational structure and building and having good hitting coaches. Brandon Crawford all of a sudden figuring out how to slug the ball. Evan Longori, while he didn't play too much slugging and whatnot. Darren Ruff, uh, Brandon Belt finally having that big breakout season. Not a, These aren't bad players, but they got the best out of them. And you see all these things. And what we also saw was they did a bunch of one-year deals. They got Gosman for another year. They said, okay, we liked you in 2020. Let's give you an 18-year, $1 million deal. Discofani, Alex Cobb, all these little pieces instead of going for the big fish. And what happened? They won 107 games. And then the other side of things, now I know that they lost to the die. Before anybody says something, yeah, but that was, (laughs) it's a historically insane matchup that the two of them were playing in the first round. And then the second thing was the Atlanta Braves. The Atlanta Braves were a team that everybody got hurt and what did they do? They made all these low cost acquisitions. They went and got um, uh, Adam Duvall, very underrated player in baseball. The Marlins actually did pretty decent with him. Great defender. They got Eddie Rosario. They got Jorge Soler. And these were guys that contributed. Jorge Soler, very unlucky first half um, for him in the season. And they got um, uh, one other player that I'm blanking on right now. 
Um, so they they just they got all these cheap things. Richard Rodriguez in terms of bullpen stuff didn't pan out too much, but they did all these little low cost additions and they won the World Series. So I've been a little bit confused as to why people are a little bit forgetting. Not that you shouldn't spend money. Not that you should be like Cleveland or some of these other teams, right? But just don't only it's it's been shown literally this past year that hey especially when you already have some good stuff in place like the Padres do, maybe start looking at like, hey, maybe a Mark Canna might be what they need. Maybe go for a little Tyler Anderson. Maybe go and find these these under-the-radar options that won't cost as much as a Nick Castellanos, as a Carlos Correa, if you have stuff already. I'm not, I'm not begrudging the Rangers because the Rangers, they need <laughs> a lot. But when you're a team that already has some pieces, like the Padres obviously do, there's a reason we thought they were going to be good in 2021 then maybe you should start looking at the bargain bin and not just say we got to give out eight-year deals. No, that's interesting because when you do look at this year's playoffs, it was a lot of unsung heroes, a lot of guys stepping up that you might have not expected. Like you said, Atlanta, Eddie Rosario. You look at the Red Sox, Kike Hernandez was on a historic yes. tear for them. Mm-hmm. In the second half of that series, Jordan Alvarez was basically the guy that carried them in those last three games. So it the is Renfro something. for the Red Sox too a little bit. They got yeah. him off of waivers or I forgot how they even got him. But like I, it's... Yeah. Do not underestimate guys that you don't – I'm not saying that this is the only way because that's what I hate is that also there are teams that use this line of the money ball way of thinking as an no. excuse to be like, well, then we shouldn't spend anything. It's like, no, Cleveland, you have Shane Bieber and Jose Ramirez. Pretty good start. You also had Lindor once upon a time. Now now you go spend. But if you have nothing like Texas, yeah, you do that. But just the lower cost additions can sometimes pay dividends. And I think that, that uh, we we learned that especially this past year. Um, even if the Giants didn't win, they still won a lot of games, and the Braves literally won the World Series. So I think people should pay attention to that. And in a year that has such a deep free agency class, too, you know what I'm saying? There's so many guys left. Castellanos is still available as a big fish, but there's so many guys left. Mark Canna was one of my favorites. Michael Conforto, uh, who I think you could get on one year prove it deal. There's a lot of guys still left, and I think teams should look into them. Yeah, one guy who's interesting that's still left because you mentioned this team earlier, that is the Giants. And the Giants are a team that I'm just, I want to see how this offseason goes because right now, I think I'm cooling a little bit on the Giants. I still got mad respect for them because I can't count them out uh, based off what they've done the last two seasons. Mm -hmm. But you're losing Gosman. You just lost Buster Posey to retirement. A lot of people can't forget that. And then Chris Bryant. Yeah, yeah, Chris Bryant's a free agent too. So like three-fifths of like the main core of this Giants team could be away next season. So I definitely want to see what the Giants are going to do this offseason because I think they're going to be a big swing team in the National League next year, depending on what they do this offseason. But one thing that I know the Giants need to really complete their offseason, the Padres probably need this too. It's a built bar, Javi. I think they That's need right. built bars because you were going to say it. I yeah. If, if you don't have a built bar, how can you even think straight to buy to, to buy free agents, pay for free agents? Because let me tell you about this, Javi. 100%. Let me tell you something. Have you ever had a built bar, Javi? Bro, have I? I you've seen me in the chats. Whenever they arrive at my door, I lose my mind like I'm Jason Statham and Crank. I go nuts. I cannot resist. I have to eat them. I love the variety too, man. That's my favorite part. What's your favorite flavor? Well, the fl- my favorite flavor is all these new holiday flavors coming mm. out at the perfect time mm. of the season because this mm. holiday season, you got to grab the protein bar that tastes like oh, a yeah. candy bar or even mm. better than a candy bar. Built Bar, filled with so much holiday goodness, rich with decadent flavor, covered in chocolate, but amazingly low in calorie, sugar, net carbs, and fat, and it's high in protein. You get the best of both worlds, delicious and healthy. So many flavors, you'll have a hard time choosing. Will you have a raspberry or mint brownie, cherry or double chocolate, cookies and cream, or peanut butter brownie? Built Bar gives you the extra fuel you'll need to bust down those mall doors and battle all the holiday shoppers. Because it's the season of peace and love, don't bring up your favorite Built Bar flavor at a family party. People are so passionate about their favorite flavor. They'll fight for it. And all it's things. True. The yeah, and my mom rides for hand. Cherry Barcia, man. Rides <laughs> she for rides Cherry for Barcia. Yeah. <laughs> hey, are you friends with Santa? Because if you are, well, tell Santa to throw a few Bilt Bars in my stocking this year because no gift is greater than a Bilt Bar. Like some of those marshmallowy treats around holidays, Bilt Bar has some beautiful Bilt Bar puffs that are just fantastic. Mwah, love a good marshmallow. Go to Bilt.com. Use promo code LOCK15. You'll get 15% off that next order. Javi, promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com now well said well said well said now i i kind of want to tie that promo code to this offseason because 
during this Padres offseason, were they trying to give Max Scherzer, were they trying to get him to take a 15% discount in free agency? Like, this is the second time the <laughs> Padres have tried to get the man, and it's the <laughs> second time he's like, hey, I think I'm going to take my services elsewhere. So are, are there why, why can't the Padres land a Max Scherzer? What's going on there? Look, as I wear my Friar Snuggie, I look like a Friar guy right now, everybody. <laughs> look, here's the thing. I'm not saying this just to be biased or anything. I don't think that was were very light, light, <laughs> light rumors. And also, I don't. This is this is a, to make fun of another person, real quick. Uh, John Heyman, who I, I I like by the way, I like his tweets and everything. Whatever. I'm just saying, like when he tweeted that thing about Chris Bryant, where he was like Padres, Mariners, <laughs> like he named like nine teams, and I was like, so I e anyone that has a decent team. And wants to compete, wants him. So what is that, like 12 off the bat? I didn't really learn anything from that tweet. You know what I'm saying? So like with the Max Scherzer thing, it was like several teams looking in. It's like, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, like, of course. Look, when Ken Rosenthal first tweeted about the whole uh, situation, he said that the Mets are have emerged as front runner. I was like, look. I've been here before, man. You know what I mean? I've I've seen this world before. You saw here. me in the chat. I had to put out the Spider-Man meme. I'm walking all sad as things burn around him or whatever. I had to post that because this man, Ken Rosenthal, ruined my birthday. That's that's a that 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 that, that is a uh, um uh, factor that doesn't get uh, discussed all that much on here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just to go Jeff Goldblum for a little bit. Uh, it's like that doesn't get discussed all that much. Is that it was on my birthday that this man just decided? Yeah. Oh yeah. He, he's going to. I mean, I lost it. I tweet I was begging for Preller to kill me. And then what happens? Goes to the Dodgers. I have never been more miserable in my life. So that all being said, they didn't need a Max Scherzer. I, mm. Not that they didn't need. Everyone could l- use a Max yeah. Scherzer, obviously. No disrespect whatsoever. But I will say, I, I wrote about this a little bit for JustBaseball.com. Great website. You guys should check it out. Um, yes. That I wrote about, like, I think there are different tiers for pitching needs. You know, DEFCON 4 being the lowest. Padres are on like DEFCON 3. You know what I mean? They have a lot of interesting guys. They've got Clevenger coming back next year. Hopefully, if Lamette can get healthy, Blake Snell showed some signs of life at the end of the season. I'm a little bit nervous about Darvish. Then you've got Joe Musgrove. You can go out and get some back of the rotation guy to help you out. And last year, or I should say the, uh, two years before in 2020, or no, just last year in 2020, keep in mind, they'd make that Trent Grisham trade and also get Zach Davies. He was a guy that was supposed to be starter number five, ended up being the third best starting pitcher on the team, or probably the second best, if we're being honest. Um so he, he was very effective. So I think that there are other ways to do this. There are signs of life. I know that on paper and recency bias says, oh, my God, look at the ERAs and everything of everybody. But would it shock you if Blake Snell came out and improved? Would it shock you if you Darvish did? It wouldn't shock you. Is it more likely or not? That can be debated. But it's not inconceivable. So therefore, I don't think they're like the Angels. You know what I mean? The Angels, it's like, oh, my God. You had Dylan Bundy as your second starter. Like you were in yeah. some deep, deep, deep stuff, right? The Diamondbacks, for example, would be another one. I know they're not necessarily in contention right now, but just in terms of rotations, uh, you know what I mean? Like just in terms of rotations, a team that doesn't need it whatsoever, the Brewers, they don't need it whatsoever. Give me a break. The Braves, uh, not really, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you get some back in the rotation, guys, but there isn't only one way to start solve starting pitching. It's not just go out and get Scherzer. It's also build smartly and, hey, Maybe you even have like seven pitchers and there's going to be that fifth spot. It just kind of interchanges and goes around all season. That's a way to go too. Yeah, they didn't need a Scherzer. It was probably more of a luxury than everything because than anything because I still think their rotation is probably their strength of their team in terms of how deep it is and the quality of it. But would I be shocked if you Darvish turned back into a Cy Young uh, candidate? Maybe a little bit. He's in his mid-30s in that post. A little post, bit, yeah. A little bit. Post, but he's still cracked out. Better effective. than last year? I wouldn't year? be surprised. That that's the thing. And I think that Padres fans need to remember, remember why that that would be my number one slogan for heading into 2022. Remember why you were hyped up before. Keep it in mind. There's so much talent on this team. Guys can play better. I think there are guys that can improve like Trent Grisham. Um, and you still got the stars like the Tatis, like your Machado, like your Cronenworth, you know, like your Joe Musgrove, who I think is going to be excellent again next year. Anybody who's worried that he overperformed, trust me, he didn't. K-rate was awesome. Uh, called strikes. I could bring up all sorts of stats to freak out all the people uh, that are going to be watching this. Oh, no, the numbers. But uh, you could you could bring up all that stuff. Musgrove's going to be great. Still a lot of stuff on this team. And by the way, 
There's plenty mm-hmm. of teams that every year we get excited about that don't go. Remember the Red Sox? Remember them? 2020, a disaster. A disaster. Year before that, not terrible, but disappointing. And what happened this year? Nearly made the World Series. Very so cool. I'm just saying, guys, this is baseball. This is sports. As long as you at least have some talent in place, things can go your way. Things can fall into place for you, and you can go pretty far. And the Padres fans should keep in mind that you got Tatis, man. So as long as you have him, I think you at least have good vibes going your way. Yeah, you still got the worst defensive player in baseball, guys, so don't worry about that. But I thought when you brought up – we're just going to gloss over what I just said. I thought when you brought up the John Heyman tweet, you are talking about how he was like, Chris Bryant might go back to the Rockies. He might choose the Rockies because of how close it is to his native hometown of Las Vegas, and the people were replying under the tweet. It's like Vegas and Colorado like 12 hours. Oh, that was hilarious, though. That was hilarious. (laughs) I was like, wait, what? (laughs) It's not like exactly up the street, John Heyman. So I don't know about that. But enough Padres talk. We did a lot of Padres talk. We're still going to do a little Padres talk, but it's going to combine both of our teams because we brought because we brought you on this pod because there was a move, a transaction that involved both of our teams. Of course, he wasn't traded to the D-backs, but the D-backs did pick up all star. Let me repeat that: all star closer Mark the Shark Melanson from the Padres. I want to know, Javi. Why did they let this guy go? Two years, $14 million, I feel like is a pretty fair deal for a guy, even though he's in his late 30s, still one of the best closers in baseball. Yeah, why did they let them let him go? It's almost as puzzling as like, why did I let it slide that you called Tatis the... the oh. Are you one of those people, the Fernando Top 15 or whatever that slogan was <laughs> or whatever? Uh, two outs above average. That's all I have to say. Uh, not the worst defender of baseball. He improved mightily in the second half. Not great. He ain't Nick <laughs> Ahmed or anything like that. He's not cool, uh, Trevor Story. He's not Carlos Correa, but not as much of a liability as people claim. Anyway, yeah. um, I know that you were just trolling, though. I, I love it when you do that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, a, little, a little jab. I think they're doing the same thing they did last year. And for, for your listeners, uh, I've said this a lot. I think that they're what they're doing is they're saying, we have some good bullpen pieces. Tim Hill, Austin Adams, if he can stop hitting people with pitches. Um, Pierce Johnson, like they've got some good stuff in there. Hopefully Drew Pomerantz comes back and whatnot. Their bullpen did really precipitously and aggressively fall in the second half, but they're like, all right, we got some stuff there. Instead of spending on one guy, Let's spend on multiple. They did this last year. Trevor Rosenthal was awesome for them. They acquired him at the deadline. Flamethrower, 100 miles an hour. Then he went for a whole lot of money for one year to Oakland. They said, you know what? Let's give Melanson and Keone Kella the amount of money we'd be giving one guy. That's basically what they decided because they knew our bullpen is okay. They're not the White Sox. They're not the Phillies. If you're one of those teams, then you start investing a little bit more. When you're in the middle of the pack, I think this might be the route to go is you kind of divvy up the money a little bit. And this year they did that with Luis Garcia, who's a 34-year-old reliever out of uh, the old Cardinals land and was very, very good this year. Some good stats on him, didn't allow any home runs. And then Robert Suarez out of um, NPB the in Japan, and he had oh. been doing some good stuff. He's a flamethrower too. He can top 102 apparently. He throws a four-seam fastball and a two-seam fastball and a changeup that wipes people out. And when you just get <laughs> pitches going that fast and then all of a sudden a changeup comes in, it can be really tough for hitters. I'm not saying his stats in in that league, he had like a 1.5 ERA, are going to translate 100%. But he could be a guy who, without Pomeranz, maybe he steps into the closers role. So they're taking a shot on him. I like it. I like that they decided let's not spend as much money here. I will say, though, I will say this. Melanson has two things. Mm. The consistency over a long time, a time of years. This isn't some other relievers who have been up and down and they had a firecracker year and they're great once. Melanson bends but doesn't break you know what i mean so i will say that about why maybe the Padres should have brought him back and the second thing is was it two years 14 million if i'm not mistaken yeah two years 14 million you know the rosenthal thing was like one year 11 or 12 million like that's a little bit more of a difference so maybe the contract isn't that bad um so those are the two reasons for why you might be upset that the Padres didn't go after him but overall i think that's what their line of thinking is and i kind of agree with it yeah and i want to ask you how confident were you and Mark Melanson when he came in games? Would you bet on Mark Melanson? But if you want to bet on anything, Javi, you know where you have to go? Oh, I, I th- it ends with AG, right? Something like that? BetOnline.ag, Javi. You ah, got it right. You got there it right. We go. Because- there we go. Bet online has you covered all season, more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football season continues to march to the playoffs. Bet online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 
50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code LOCKED ON to receive your bonus from basketball, football, NHL, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available available for the 2021 season. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet Online, where the game starts. And Javi, I want to ask you. When Mark Melanson was coming to the games, would you have gone to bet online and place a wager that the Padres are going to close it out with Mark Melanson on the mound? How confident were you as a Padres fans when you saw him enter the game in a high leverage moment? So he's one of those guys that you don't always want to watch him because mm, he's very scary. <laughs> and what I mean by that is he doesn't strike out a lot of guys. This is not yeah. a flamethrower at all. His velocity is peaks at around like 93, maybe occasionally 94 miles per hour. He doesn't throw all that hard. But what he does throw is he he toys with you. That's what the shark does. He taunts you. You see the fin coming up, but then he never strikes. You know what I mean? He just keeps showing the fin and then goes down. And then and then before you know it, you're swinging at nonsense and you're like, oh my god, he wasn't aiming for me. He destroyed my boat. You know what I mean? He ate my boat apart. And then all of a sudden you're you're out, right? Or you hit into a double player, what have you. He does make you nervous sometimes because of the lack of strikeouts. Innings go very long with him. I learned that the hard way as someone <laughs> on the East Coast and the games are, you know, on the West Coast. It'd be like, oh my God, it's 145. Why is it taking 30 Shut minutes? Shut it down, this? Mark. <laughs> Shut it down, Shark. Um, so that, that could be a little frustrating sometimes. But in terms of just the value, in terms of just the results, the man gets it done. The man gets it done. And also does not allow the big hit. Yeah, he might allow a couple singles and be like, oh no. And he walks the guy. But he manages to get away out of it. You know what I'm saying? And like I mentioned before, the consistency. So that's what I think D-backs fans should expect from him. Um, and they should say, you know what? Yeah, he's going to make us nervous at times. But overall, when you just look at just the overall results, I'm not even saying advanced data or anything. Gets the job done. Yeah, the D-backs were at last in the National League in saves. And you say, well, they were a terrible team. Of course, they're going to be dead last in saves. Well, they were also dead last in save percentage. So even when they had those opportunities, mm -hmm. they could not convert. They were terrible in high leverage moments late in game. So getting Mark Melanson, guy who you said does not strike out a lot of people, but his ground ball percentage was above 50%. He's one of the only few guys strikeout percentage above 20 with a ground ball percentage above 50. So he's definitely not going to hurt you. A phenomenal ERA last season as well. So I'm very excited for mark the shark he has the fourth most saves among active relievers so we're getting a true we, we the d-backs have been getting vets the last couple off seasons with the hector rondones and the joaquin sorias but the difference is this is the guy who's a vet and still producing like he's in mm -hmm. his prime unlike those other those other guys the d-backs have been signing are just straight up wash most of them yeah, mark melanson it's, seems it's to go yeah. great man <laughs> yeah it's gonna <laughs> it go great. great yeah so mark melanson seems to be the real deal and can hopefully salvage the ninth inning for the d-backs if they ever get there with the lead hopefully mark melanson can close it because that has been a big issue for the d-backs this past season but as we wrap up here, Javi, I just want to get a little CBA talk in here before we wrap up here in the next few minutes. Let's I want to ask Let's do you, it, man. Let's do it. We're in a lockout. We see the players fighting. We see the owners fighting. They they got to come to a compromise, hopefully. But of the reported things, the rumored things that might be getting argued over during this lockout, what would you like to actually see being implemented? We've seen players, they, they, they're arguing for getting to free agency quicker, changing arbitration, uh, trying to fix the tanking problem. I don't really know how you do that. And you look from the owner side, maybe more playoffs, more teams in the playoffs, maybe a pitch clock. So what from this potential lockout do you actually want to see implemented or wouldn't mind seeing implemented in baseball as a new rule? I think, I think as someone who isn't a super expert, mm -hmm. I will start with the most obvious, and I know locked on MLB hosts, Paul Francis Sullivan, but please call him Sully. Yeah. Would disagree with me when I say this, but Oh, it's the I know where you're going. DH. Yeah. It's the universal DH. And the thing that people forget is it's not, and not I'm not saying, I'm just, I don't mean literally all the time people forget, but um, yeah, it's really dumb to watch pitchers hit. It's Very. fun when you're just someone who's scrolling around for like a month of the season. Yeah, it gets a little, we had that. Remember early on in the year when DeGrom drove in more runs and oh, he yeah. allowed them? Fun little story. You know what else is fun? Watching moon tanks from Fran Mil Reyes, not having to worry about Nick Castellanos' defense and just deciding, you know what? I like hearing the meme. I love seeing the home runs when tragedies happen from MLB Home Run on Twitter. I love that stuff. I like being able to just figure out who's going to be the next big hitter, who's going to be the next poppy, who's going to be Jordan, who's going to be all these guys. And number two is this. I just sent it. You, you fix your roster. It literally makes roster construction and especially free agency of the deadline more fun. 
breaking news to everybody, Nelson Cruz would have a much bigger market if not for oh, the yeah. fact that the National League doesn't have a DH. There you go. That's all of a sudden. And no, it's only some, it's only one at bat, man. It's like, yeah, but you give certain guys days off. That means that if you give certain guys days off, maybe the shortstop, for example, the alleged worst defender in baseball, maybe that means that the Padres go <laughs> out and say, let's get a backup shortstop sort of guy. And maybe they won't be stars or whatever, but it makes roster construction so much more fun. Yes. And, and the other thing is a lot of people say, well, the strategy, man. It's like, okay, Stop so the it. strategy, the strategy is if your pitcher is doing well, you don't pitch hit. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean? You don't pitch it for him. If the pitcher is doing meh and his pitch count is high, then you do. It's like this isn't that much of a strategy. It doesn't make up for. This isn't like saying uh, you can no longer throw the ball in football. You know what I mean? Like that, it would be killing strat. No, like there's plenty of things that you can do uh, still that are very fun. And I think that the strategy, it's a team building thing, man. I think that's what people forget. It is so much fun. So that's the thing that I think unequivocally I stand by uh, in terms of something that even without knowing, if I knew nothing, about the lockout and all the incentives, which I know a little bit about, and I have some opinions on that, that would be the number one thing. I'd be like, bringing the universal DH, people will forget and not complain about it after like three weeks. You know yeah. why? Because we saw in 2020 they didn't complain about it. Exactly. Everyone was like, oh, this is actually kind of fun. I get to just watch an extra batter. This is great. I don't have to see in the playoffs, and we saw it this year in big situations, you know, uh, b- b- like first and second, nobody out, but then a pitcher comes up, and you're like, it just feels, and there is something to be said for momentum and giving that free out. Oh yeah. I think there's a reason why always the national league has the alleged best pitchers in it. And I think having a free out has a little bit to do with it. That's just my opinion though. Yeah. I feel like 80% of the people who are pro pro, not, or I guess anti-universal DH entering the 2020 season. I feel like 80% of those people flip their minds. Once they actually saw the universal DH get implemented for the shortened season, they're like, Whoa, I get some extra offense in these games. It actually makes it a little bit more watchable. And I do agree. I actually think there could be more strategy with a DH because all of a sudden you got a big poppy coming up in the lineup. You got Nelson Cruz. You got to figure out how to pitch around that guy. It's not, oh, I got Madison Bumgarner coming up with the bases loaded. Let me just throw strike to him and let him, you know, if he wants to hit a double, he hits a double. But I'm not going to be afraid of a Madison Bumgarner at the plate, even though he might be the best pitcher hitter in baseball. So I think there is still strategy if there was a DH at the plate, a real DH as opposed to a pitcher. So you already know I'm pro universal DH. I think it's silly. I think it could also help out the Hall of Fame cases for more DHs mm. because all of a sudden it's not like I'm just playing in half the league. I get the full MLB I could play in now. It's not just limited to 15 teams anymore. I get the full sport. So I also think it could help out a little bit with the Hall of Fame eligibility too, or not even eligibility, just getting in some of these guys who might be full time DHs in their career. So I think it could also help in that area. So I'm definitely pro universal dh and then for the the rule i think i want to see the most maybe get implemented is expanding the postseason to 14 teams and it sounds kind of weird but i think it would not only make the sport more exciting but i think it could also help the tanking problem a little bit in baseball too because you look at the nba i was against the nba doing this play in tournament you now have 10 teams that essentially have a shot at the playoffs. And I was like, why do we need more teams? They already have more than half the league making the playoffs in the NBA. But now I look at it, I'm like, you got these teams that would have felt like they're not in it going to the season, now actually trying and not tanking. Because if I get that 10th spot, all of a sudden I have a chance of making the playoffs, making the playing tournament, and all of a sudden my season is salvaged. So for baseball, over a course of a 162-game season, I think you need that 14 team playoff because all of a sudden it makes these bottom dwellers a little bit more watchable. All of a sudden they think if we get hot for one month, maybe we could be in the postseason mix. So I think the 14 team playoff could actually be a bigger benefit than people realize from the player side. It could stop ending the tanking problem. Teams and owners might feel like we might have more of a chance with this extra playoff spot. Maybe we spend a little bit more money. We're not trying to win a World Series, but if we could get into the postseason and get a little bit of that extra playoff money, that could go a long way for our team. So I think this expanded playoffs could help out a lot. And also one further point on your universal DH. I think we saw this past postseason. I think there was a couple of postseason games where there was a starter, I think, for the Braves or something where he was going like five or six innings strong, but they were getting absolutely no offense. And then they finally had an opportunity where they had like two dudes on base. It might be their only opportunity to score runs. And they took out their best pitcher who was dealing. Yep. And they put in some random dude off the bench because they had to. They had to take out their guy who yep. was dealing just to get some some guy in the bench uh, off the bench in the game. So there is strategy there, I guess. But is that a strategy that's 
better for the sport? Is it better for the sport to take out one of your best pitchers and put in some crappy guy at the plate just to bring in some reliever after that? I don't think that's better for the sport. I think it would be better for the sport to have your pitcher, your starter who's dealing in the game and still have a real offensive at bat come up to the lineup come up to the plate in the next half inning. So I'm definitely pro universal DH. I'm definitely pro bringing 14 teams to the postseason. Uh, Cause I don't even know how many teams make the postseason now. 12, 10. I don't even yeah, know. Something like, that, something like that. Yeah. Something um, like that. The only thing I'll say, because you, you did go for, for a little bit, just because <laughs> yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to like uh, prolong the point too much. I do disagree. I do oh. not want to see more uh, teams in the playoffs. I think that while I do understand the NBA comparison, that is a comparison that makes sense where more teams, more fan bases getting engaged and being like, well, there is something to root for. At least it's mm -hmm. like something to watch. I do agree with that. However, the counter to that is Ooh. what happens when an, a team that's 82 and 82 makes it. Does that make it that, you know, uh, say, uh, what was it? What was a team that wasn't very good in like 2020, for example? Like a How team we take the Braves this year? The Braves weren't that good this year when they made the they, playoff. They did. That's true. That is true. It's 100% a fair point. But then what if you have more of that? What that does is potentially make teams be like, well, if I'm in the playoffs, then why spend super big if anyone can beat anybody sometimes in these playoff series? Then, you know, I mean, we saw the White Sox lose. We saw teams like the Brewers lose to the Braves. The I, If I'm a team, I'm saying like, uh, yeah, let's just hope that we're all like the Atlanta Braves and don't spend big money on some big free agents. They are discouraged from spending more money on players. And they instead say, uh, let's just like put together. Yeah, we'll spend on a little bit. We'll have our Jose Ramirez in there. But for the most part, just hope that we finish 500. I don't know if we want to create more of a situation in which 500 or at times below 500 teams, if you did that in baseball, were to make the playoffs. I can't speak for what the actual divisional results would have been this mm -hmm. year if we had the 14 teams. But in my opinion, I just I just don't see it. I think that's another way for the owners just trying to make uh, more money or for themselves, basically, because they don't want to pay premium talent. And the other thing is with arbitration. I don't know exactly the perfect fix. Yeah, I'm a little bit confused. Some people have talked about that you ramp it up and that it increases by 20% every year. That's one argument that I've heard from a good friend of mine. Um, shout out my guy, Colby. Um, but in overall, it is a little bit complicated. I get that. But it is also true. That it's a little bit weird that you're obviously owners. They're saying, no, we, we actually want to prolong. Uh, before players go into free agency. Yeah, of course you do, because you want to still keep paying them like $6 million a year, and you want to prolong things for this long, and then players only get to get paid when they're 30, and they're literally past their prime. You know what I'm saying? They're not getting paid for when they know that they're in their prime, and I think that that hurts the sport a little bit. I always wished, I've been saying this for a long time, I don't think this is part of it. This isn't something that they would argue uh, for the players, at least they wouldn't say this, but one thing about the NBA is there ain't people signing no 10-year deals in the mm -hmm. NBA. I actually think I love the Tatis thing. He's a Padre for life, practically, or at least for his prime. But is it good for the sport? I don't know always. I think it would be really fun if it's like five years max that you can give anybody. Oh. You can still do the per year amount. I get that. But again, I understand that baseball is so much different than these other sports. Guys fall off more and the age. It's, a, it's just it's a different league. It's a different sport. So I do get the security of it. And this would never happen. But I have to admit, part of me is like, I wish that we got these five year to 60 million or whatever it has to cost, right? Instead of uh, just uh, this prolonged thing where I'm like, Bryce Harper, we're going to be on the same team for how long? You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, it's just, it's just, it creates this kind of dynamic. But then again, um, there's so many, so many issues, man. I mean, we got minor leaguer issues. I know that they're, they're still in session and all that, but the issues with the minor leagues and not paying them enough, that's really awful. I know that they've made some progress in that area, even if not enough. You've got things like, uh, already talked about the DA arbitration, and uh what's the other thing i i wish we could just keep the damn rule of the ghost runner on second i think people are full of crap and i think that we should allow it guess what there's 162 <laughs> games god forbid 15 of them have this extra little gimmick for you to watch and same thing goes for the double header rule i wish we could keep that but that's kind of my main opinions on the collective bargaining agreement in terms of just kind of what we may see get implemented as far as i know there's probably something i'm missing but hey what, what can i say but we've been talking for a while we talk yeah. for a while mode, and I enjoy it very much. I enjoy it very much. Yeah, I try. I told you 18 minutes. We're almost at 40 now, so I guess I lied <laughs> a little bit. And I don't get all the pushback against the guy on second and extra innings too. Like I don't think mm -hmm. it makes that big of a deal to my overall viewing experience of baseball. It's kind of like, like red like, zone. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're scrolling. You're scrolling through games. And you're like, oh, look! It's the whole. We might see the game end right here. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Let me put it on. Right? Why not? And also, if they could fix that somehow, why are we got a, a, an entire state? That doesn't that doesn't get to watch their like a baseball game. Like, what are we doing, MLB? You're in third place in terms of relevancy. You should be giving away free games. 
hey, people in a town, a city that doesn't have a baseball team, we'll give you 30 games of your choice every year for free if you do this and that. W- why aren't they doing that? Instead, they're the ones like, come to us. It's like, I got breaking news for you, man. People are watching esports more than baseball sometimes. Like, get 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 to the, the thing. Not to take a shot at esports. Love esports, but no, it's just video, come on baseball. Oh. Those video game no, championships, man. they get a lot of they, they go stupid, of man. They, they no. go crazy, man. No slander, Dota. Dota. Yeah, Dota things, yeah. League. Yo, go check out Arcane, by the way. The League of Legends Netflix. Woo! Mm. Fire. First genuinely incredible video game adaptation. And I cannot believe that it was the League of Legends one. Trust me, it is genuinely not like a can't be good, but like good, good. I've been saying this on my podcast for a while. Everybody go check that out. It's really good. Wow. Hey, Mega podcast. <laughs> Mega podcast this Friday. 40 minutes long. We thought we were doing 18. Somehow we doubled it. We didn't expect it. Javi, for the people listening on Spotify, Apple, wherever they want to listen, that's not YouTube. Where can they find you on social media? At Javapeno on Twitter, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. That is me, all sorts of memes. I write about pop culture stuff. Going to be writing about uh, some anime stuff over the next week, actually, which should be really fun for a couple websites I haven't written for before, so that's really exciting. Of course, though, also Lockdown Padres on Twitter, at L-O underscore Padres. All sorts of Padres memes and whatnot. I respond to people a whole bunch on there. Getting better at responding to people, especially. uh, Mm. So we have a lot of fun on there. And then Lockdown Padres on YouTube. If you want to see the Ooh. video version, and if you want to see me in my friar uniform, then you can oh, check yeah. me out there on YouTube, Locked on Padres. Go check out Javi. Go check out Just Baseball. Where, where's that? Where can they find the Just Baseball? I got oh, Just the Baseball, Just EB Media, ladies and gentlemen. You can check them out on Twitter. We just surpassed 1,500 followers. Follow the TikTok. You know how many followers we got on TikTok? TikTok like 96,000. 96,000 followers. We are killing it. 96,000? Yeah, man. Hey, just baseball. Oh We're God. killing it out here, man. We're killing it out here. I'm a staff writer over there. I'm kind of part of the the staff. Uh, that's this new thing set up by my buddy Aram Blayton, who hosts Locked On MLB Prospects. He's really great. Great website. All sorts of content. I just wrote about Robbie Ray being one of my favorite uh, breakout stories this year. Wow. I know he's an old an, an old flame of yours, <laughs> Mr. Robbie Ray, <laughs> and how just the the weirdness of baseball. I love him so much. Uh, because instead of just being entertaining to watch because he gave up home runs, he was yeah. just good, objectively good this year. So I love that. Talked about the signing a whole bunch. Um, so you can check that out at JustBaseball.com, of course. Thank you, Miller, for plugging that. Yeah, no worries. He was so good that baseball said, hey, you're the best pitcher in the league this year. So here's a, the Cy Young <laughs> Award. So very shocking to see. <laughs> Javi, sir, thanks for coming on. Thanks for giving me your time today. And I'll catch you next time, sir. I'm going to have to.